I'd like to talk about the internal family systems model and its understanding of grief, because this, I think, is a very helpful way of working with the inevitability of grief and loss. The way to understand grief is we attach. We're human beings. We attach to, from our hearts in love. And whatever we attach to, person, place, or thing, idea, at some point we may lose. And when we lose the thing that we're attached to, we move into a process, and that process we call grief or grieving. That process may be overwhelming, bewildering, isolating, and painful, and it may precipitate a crisis of meaning. What tends to happen after a significant loss is the first parts of the system that come in to help us deal are parts that go into shock, experience numbness, and disbelief. This cannot have happened. And that's true if you've ever lost your car, if it's been stolen or it's not where you thought it was, you'll notice this can't be true, it must be here somewhere. Those parts will come up. One of the reasons those protective parts come up with numbness and disbelief is because behind them there are other parts with really big feelings in response to the loss. Typically those feelings include sadness, protesting, it's not okay that it's gone, it's not okay that he died, it's not okay that my car got stolen. Missing and yearning, particularly in the loss of a person, it's really missing them and the connections or an animal. Searching, looking for them somewhere, it sounds crazy sometimes, but looking for that person somewhere if they've died. Or the animal maybe putting the uh, dog bowl down, hearing the cat scratch at the door. These are all manifestations of searching. Powerlessness. I can cry, I can get mad. At the end of the day, the loss has occurred and there's nothing I can do about it. And sometimes that realization will lead to despair. These are all parts that are holding these distressing feelings. And they're parts that are being protected from, initially, by the protective system. Sometimes guilt is part of loss, too. The more significant the loss, the more profound the disruption in the system. And the responses to that loss may be manager-led, they may be firefighter-driven, they may be erupting exiles with powerful energies and feelings about them, and or you may experience all of the above. The protective system may be thrown into disarray and unable to function normally, and the reality and meaning of the loss moves through the system as a wave over time. And what that means is there'll be an initial recognition of what's lost, and gradually that loss will move through the system as different parts become alert to that loss. Manager parts may respond to that by saying, keep busy. Just keep busy, keep doing stuff, stay numb, avoid triggers. Don't go to the grave site if it's the loss of a person. Remove the pictures so you're not triggered. Managers may say, you just have to be resigned. It's happened, there's nothing you can do. Sometimes the emotional responses will be displaced. Right? So I might be really sad at a movie that I've seen, but I'm not connecting the sad part to the loss that's occurred recently in my life. Another common response to loss is to try and replace. Right? But that replacing is, of course, reinvesting too quickly. It's very common with the death of a pet, for example, that uh, a new puppy will be acquired a short time after the beloved dog has died. And that leads to complications because the new puppy is not the beloved dog, and the beloved dog needs to be grieved. And the new puppy may be found to be irritating and frustrating, and there's not an openness to loving it. Can't replace. Need to grieve. Another common response from the protective system is to minimize, cognitively diluting the meaning of the loss. Well, we weren't that close, or it wasn't that big a deal. Right? And another way that the protective system will manifest a response to loss is through somaticizing the loss, physical distress, migraines, gastrointestinal distress, sleep disturbances. These are common somatic responses to the distress of the loss. Right? And those are all managers. The firefighters may also have increased activity, right? wanting to distract or provide comfort from these parts that are so distressed. Right? So there may be an increase in, or the adoption of, drinking, 
drugging behaviors, experiences of rage or perhaps smaller than that, intense irritation, right? anger, getting triggered really easily, being fractious, or hours and hours spent mindlessly watching TV, right? or just eating and eating, or sex binging, perhaps overworking, you're putting all that energy into work. And there may be new firefighter activity, so it may feel like the person's not known to themselves. They may find suicidal ideation comes up. Somebody's lost their child. They may question, why do I want to continue living? A child has died. And that's a normal firefighter response. Another thing that tends to occur in loss is that the present loss will trigger parts connected to former loss events that may not have been fully attended to. We all have a history of attaching and losing, and sometimes those losses in childhood will come up to be revisited because there are parts still connected to those losses. Protective parts may become entrenched because of the perceived threat from or to the exiles. So if there's a part which is really vulnerable and distressed around the loss, the protectors may just insist that they're going to keep taking the lead in the system. Unburdening parts that are connected to our loss history those young parts that may be there, will facilitate healing and greater resiliency in terms of subsequent losses. If we know that we can handle the parts that come up and attend to them and appreciate them and acknowledge them in response to the inevitable losses of life, then we develop a kind of self-led skill set around uh, attaching and losing and the inevitability of that. When we have parental loss, no matter what age we are, young parts will come up that miss mom and dad. Some of them, six years old, may be younger. And those parts don't comprehend the permanence of death. They may be repeatedly asking why they can't have them back. And that's fine, and it's important to attend to. Each time they ask, we attend to their distress. As we develop more self-leadership with regard to our parts that help us move through losses and move to a place of reattaching, we attend to them as they arrive, and we're able to go about our lives and move through our grief work without becoming overwhelmed, stuck, or incapacitated. When our grieving parts know that we're available for them, and they pop up during our day, it becomes possible to say, I know you're grieving. I'm going to attend to you, but right now we're real busy. How about if I come back to you later tonight when we have some time? When there's enough trust in self-leadership, those grieving parts can pull back a bit, as long as they know they're going to be attended to. And importantly, that contract must be followed through. Otherwise, they will learn they can't trust self. But if they know that they're going to be attended to, they can pull it back. Now, significantly, in loss, there are two clusters that get triggered. I focused a lot on the loss cluster because that is what gets most of our attention. But at the same time, there's a restoration cluster of parts dealing with the new complexities of life resulting from the loss and also helping us to engage in looking towards the future. It is too stressful to spend all the time in grief and there's a natural oscillation between these two parts. If you like, it's a dance of self-regulation. And these oscillating clusters keep us from psychic numbing on the one hand and emotional flooding on the other. It's okay to look at, well, I guess, you know, my parents have died. Oh, there's a part of me saying, uh, I'm going to have some money, right? And it wants to talk about what we're going to do with that money. That is natural and normal and makes sense. Not all of your parts are going to be in the distress of the grief. And understanding that can be helpful. You know, it can be helpful when there's a part coming in saying, you're a terrible person, you're thinking about money. No, that's a natural way to respond as the two clusters oscillate around the loss and around moving forward. So that's how the process typically looks, of attaching and losing. Sometimes that process becomes more complicated. And in complicated grief, uh, we have a similar process going on. But what tends to complicate the grief is the loss is sudden and unexpected, maybe traumatic, suicide, homicide, or mutilation. It's an example of traumatic grief. There may be extreme or prolonged suffering or distress which is going to result in a grieving response which is more traumatized. When losses occur out of order, for example, as in the death of a child, it's more likely to result in a more complex grief reaction. And disenfranchised grief, grief that is not socially supported, tends to become more complicated. For example, 
if a mother's son is killed and he's been on death row and he's a rapist, is she going to be supported in her grief? If someone's grieving a miscarriage, if someone's grieving an animal, are they going to be socially supported? Or are there people that are going to minimize and trivialize those losses? And that may result in a shaming manager internally. You shouldn't be grieving this. What's wrong with you? It was just a dog. So the disenfranchised grief brings a level of complexity to grief work as well. There may be an ambivalent relationship to who's been lost, right? For example, an abusive parent or partner. And there'll be different parts that need to be attended to. Maybe some parts are glad they've gone. Maybe some parts finally feel, feel safe, as well as the parts that miss. Maybe some parts grieve the parent I didn't have, or the parent I should have had, and could finally be heard. These more complex responses may include delayed grief or prolonged grief or grief that appears to be absent for a period of time. Those are all common in complex grief. Self-led grieving allows us to attend to the clusters of parts that come up with the inevitable losses that we experience. And as we move through life, those losses become more and more evident. Midlife is often a time when we reflect on what didn't happen. What were the hopes and dreams of our life that we lost? As we continue to age and we move into elderhood, we may lose our friends, we may lose our faculties, we may lose our capacity to do things. And it's important to attend to the parts that are connected to those losses so we don't get buried in them and we don't just become identified with our parts that are grieving. For me, self-led grieving is about developing a skill set of attending to those parts so that we don't drown in them and so that they are helped. And if you're curious about learning more about this, I've written a chapter in about transitions, loss, and death. And it's in an upcoming book, this is 2016, Innovations and Elaborations in Internal Family Systems Therapy. It's published by Routledge and it's edited by Martha Sweezy and Ellen Siskind.